Um, I'm not a developer. Um, I spend most of my time uh, traveling the world and speaking at conferences, usually to Joomla groups, but to some other open source communities as well. And I want to just share some of our experiences in the Joomla world about how to manage a community. If you're a Star Trek fan, you'll know Tribbles. They grow, they're completely uncontrollable, they can't be managed, and that's exactly what a community is. The best thing you can do is to try and manage them, to keep them slightly under control. So what's it like working with an international community? So um, as I said, my name is Brian Tierman and uh, Joomla rocks, but I'm just a user of Joomla. I have no official role. Um, I don't have a Joomla car. Um, I don't have a Joomla jet. I'm just a, U a regular community member of Joomla dreaming of beer. So there's a couple of things that I'm not going to be speaking about in this session. Typo 3, Flow, or Neos. Okay? Uh, so that makes difference to all the other sessions that you've been to so far and are going to go to in the next two days. Um, I'm not going to speak about them because I don't know anything about them, I'll be honest. Um, at least I actually knew what Typo 3 was. Uh, to quite a few of the other Joomla developers um, in America that I said I was coming to the Typo 3 conference, they went, what's Typo 3? So it was a start that I knew what Typo 3 was. So I'm not going to be talking about Typo 3 Flow or, C um, Flow or Neos. I am going to be talking about Joomla. But I'm not, as I said at the beginning, I'm not talking about Joomla, the software, the CMS, and what it can do and what it can't do. Because you're Typo 3 users. That's great. So I'm not here to convert you, stop you using Typo 3 and to start using Joomla. I'm here to just share what we found about what it's like to run a community. From some of the sessions I've been to so far, some of the conversations I've had, we're really similar. We have the same issues. So I just want to share some of those. So what is the structure of the Joomla community? Well, the first thing is, who's in charge of Joomla? And the answer is no one. Yeah, we don't have a big boss. Okay, so some other CM, open source CMS have a big boss. We don't. We don't have a dictator, benevolent or otherwise. Yeah, we don't have anything like that. As Leslie said this morning about secret groups, we don't have a secret group either. And what's really strange is we kind of don't have a planned direction either. What happens will happen. Yeah, if people want it to go that way and people contribute to it, that's what's going to happen. So what is Joomla's project structure? How does it all put together? How do we achieve what we achieve? So the first thing is we do have a non-profit association. It's called Open Source Matters. And that exists to look after the domain name, the money, the trademark, copyright, any legal stuff. And it is designed to be weak. Yeah, it, open Source Matters cannot say the next version of Joomla is going to have this feature because it's nothing to do with them. They're only responsible for the domain name, the money, the trademark, and the copyright. Yeah? It's made up of community members. They get elected. They get proposed. They stand for one or two years. They have roles, but just to do with these things. So they're not running the project. So what is our leadership model? Well, our leadership model has evolved over time. We've tried various different ones, and different ones have worked for a different period of time depending on our growth and our size. And we've learned which ones work by testing. And just like these guys, sometimes it crashes, and you've got to change. So we've not always changed because we were ready for a change. Something we've, sometimes we've changed because we had no choice. Yeah, we had to change our structure. So what are these different leadership styles? So this is one you don't see, yeah, the whip. Yeah, there is nobody there, you will do this. You will do this. You know, that doesn't happen. Sometimes we'd like it to happen, but that doesn't happen. So at the beginning, we had a very flat structure. Yeah, we had what we called in those days a core team. Um, it wasn't quite as many as this, this, it was about 15 people. And they pretty much did everything, and that worked really well until everybody suffered burnout. Yeah, I was a great classic example of this. I walked out of my office one day and I didn't go back. Yeah, I just burnt out of work, I burnt out of family relationships, 
I burnt out of involvement in Joomla. The lean method, the flat method, with just everybody having equal roles and doing everything together, sounds great. But once you get beyond a certain size, it just doesn't work. You can't do everything. You don't have enough hours in the day. So we then switched to a more traditional pyramid structure. Yeah, lots of volunteers at the bottom, gradually working your way up to the leaders. And again, that worked. But then we had this mix between things that were definitely about code and things that were definitely about community. So we wanted to have leaders involved in organizing community aspects like events and user groups, and leaders involved in talking about the code. And one pyramid doesn't work for that. Because what happened is someone's near the top because they're involved in organizing user groups. Doesn't mean to say they even know anything about code. So they shouldn't be at the top from a code point of view. So we switched to having multiple pyramids. Yeah, so we could have, and that's kind of where we were at. We had a production team what we call production leadership team and a community leadership team. And the two teams were completely separate, looked after different areas, and had their own structure. Now, pyramids themselves are a very traditional structure for organization, for, for structuring your organization. The problem with a pyramid is it's very hard for a new person to get to the top. Yeah, it's very hard to get somebody in, and as they contribute more for them to move up the ladder, because they can't move up the ladder until somebody else comes down. And being completely voluntary, community-based, with no one at the top, no big dictator, no boss, there's nobody to say, oi, you, goodbye. Yeah? So that, that's kind of been a problem for us. We get people who work their way up to the top through good, hard work, great skills, but then life takes over and they no longer have the time. And it's very difficult, we've found, to encourage people to step down, to acknowledge that they've done what they can do and they need to take a break, sometimes for their own health yeah, or for the health of their business or their family. And it's very difficult to do that. So we kind of had to rethink that whole structure. And we kind of got to circles. And so we broke down the tasks into smaller groups. And we've got circles, of, so that's a group of people working on a specific task. So that big frying pan there, that might be the people managing the forum and doing that sort of stuff. That one might, the next one might be the people managing events or something like that. But you can't have those circles operating on their own. They need to be connected. So we still have these teams that those circles sit inside. And those teams are made up of representatives from each of those uh, circles. So the forum has somebody representing them on the higher level. And that's kind of the way that it's supposed to work. And you end up with lots and lots of different circles, which is great because it lets people move in, it lets them move from different circles, and you don't really notice that much if somebody's in a circle and they stop contributing. Is that the answer? Possibly. Have we solved this problem of how to manage it, how to get new people in, how to encourage them? Definitely not. We can definitely improve. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here, to learn as well how Typo3 does this sort of stuff. And maybe I can go back to the Joomla community and share some of that information. But one thing we did realize is that fundamentally, it's all about the people. And that's the most important thing about everything. It's all about the people that are there. This is some uh, of uh, the German Joomla user group. Um, you can see for them, there is a computer in there, but beer does seem to be the most important thing. That's not true of the entire of Joomla. You know, beer isn't the most important thing. Some people do like wine. Um, but you know, it does seem to pay a large part of it. So it's not just about people. It's about having leaders. And every community needs to have leaders. But you also need to have managers. Yeah, people who are, will actually do the work. It's no point me saying, I've got this great idea, I want you all to do this, if these people don't exist to actually do it. So you've got to have leaders and you've got to have managers. And most importantly, you've got to have users, which is the, your base of your community. So what are some of the challenges that we have faced? I'm glad these Tribble slides are working. I, wasn't, I was a little bit unsure if Star Trek was too geeky, but clearly it does. So what are some of the challenges that we face? Well, one of the challenges is how much time does someone have to volunteer? 
Now, we get situations, we've got people in the commu in Joomla community who have retired. They're not necessarily old, they've just retired. So they've got loads of time to contribute. You've got other people who've just got like one hour a week or one hour a month. So it's how much time have you got to be able to contribute? One of the problems with that, how much time, is let's say you're in a group that's going to organize our Joomla conference, very similar to this one, and you have a team meeting, and you allocate tasks. And everybody goes away, and Olivier has been given the task to work out all the funding and the, the budget. And we come back one month later for the next meeting, and it's, I've done my task, he's done his task. Olivier, have you done it? Well, no, I've been really busy this month. Yeah, so that's one of the challenges, is how do we manage that available time? Yeah, we haven't got a solution to that. Yeah, we just, oh, one thing, only solution that you can have to that is to be aware that that is an issue. So I struggle with it. When I'm on a team and someone, one of my teammates doesn't do the job that they've been given to do, which stops me then being able to do my job, I get annoyed. But I have to be aware that it's been because of the available time. Now, Joomla is very much a world pro worldwide project. So we have people all over the world using Joomla and involved in the various teams. So what time is it? That's quite difficult to arrange a meeting when someone in Australia, someone in Europe, and someone in the USA can be online at exactly the same time. There, there is no time where it's convenient for all of you. you, know, you have to make sure that you adjust it. You don't want to make the Australians always have to get out of bed at 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah, sometimes the Americans have to do it. Europeans are great because we're in the middle, so we're all all right. Um, but that's difficult. You can also have fun as well, arranging a meeting at 9 o'clock on Tuesday. Who's 9 o'clock and who's Tuesday? Because that happens as well. I've been, I've been waiting for a meeting. I've been sat there at my computer waiting for the meeting to start and nothing happens, and I was on the wrong time, and wrong time, wrong time zone, and wrong day. So we have to be aware of that. We make a lot of use of timeanddate.com uh, to cope with those sort of issues. And then we have cultural time. Yeah? Uh, we're all familiar, I hope, with tomorrow and manana. Uh, the, two that are cut, uh, the one that's cut off is later, and the one that's in Greek also is very similar to manana. It means I will do it, not now, but next. When is next? When is soon? Yeah, it's different for everybody. Yeah? So you have to be aware that when somebody from one culture says, I'll do it tomorrow, they actually mean the day after today. And in other cultures, they mean, I'm not going to do it today, but I will do it at some point in the future. Yeah, so that, that's, a, that's a challenge. Um, you have to be aware of it. Now, what about the language that we use? Which language do we speak? So Joomla is officially available in 67 languages. This is an old slide, but I quite like it, so I'm going to keep this one. Uh, it should have been 68. I have a half-finished Klingon translation. Um, the only problem with Klingon is Klingon's great for all the negatives. You know, not allowed, permission denied. It's not very good for the positives, so that's why it's half-finished. So if Joomla is available in all those languages, how can we communicate to each other? And the way we do it is we communicate in English. Um, I've written the Queen's English because the official language of Joomla is British English. Yeah, not American English or Australian, but British English. That causes issues on itself. Because to me, there is only one English. It's British English. I'm from Britain. Of course that's right. For the Americans, that's not always the same. And sometimes you get some interesting ones. It's not too bad when you're typing, but when you're speaking, it can be different. So I was at a conference in America, and I was talking about the next beta release, and everybody was, sorry, the next beta release, and everybody was looking at me, what are you talking about? And somebody interrupted and said, oh, Brian means beta. Oh, right. So you get issues just of your accent as well, not just of the words that you use. But that's just among the people who speak English as their first language. Imagine what it's like for the people who speak English as their second or third or fourth language. I mean, you said you're from Romania. Which is English? Is it second, third, fourth? 
Okay. Yeah, it really depends, you know, wherever you go, it depends. Um, so one thing you have to be aware about is when someone's communicating to you online, especially if they're typing, are they writing in English or are they using Google or something to translate it? Now, I don't suppose anybody in here speaks Welsh. Okay, good, because if I make a mistake, you can't correct me. So th this is a, a, a real sign. Um, at the top, it says, no entry for heavy vehicles. And in the bottom, in, in Welsh, it says, I'm sorry, I'm out at the office at the moment. Please contact me later. But the email said, please, can you translate this for me to Welsh? And that's what came back, and that's what they printed. <laughs> so we, we don't know when someone's typing to us what language you know, did they actually type it? Google Translate is actually really good when English is one of the languages. If you go from German to English, English to German, it's not bad. If you go from German to French, it's horrendous. Yeah? So if English is one of them, it's not too bad. But we can never tell um, which language someone's actually writing you know, themselves. Which one do they really understand? And that causes interesting things. Because sometimes someone will describe something. So I'm going to pick on some German friends of mine. And they'll describe something, and it makes perfect sense to them, because they've literally translated the German. But in English, it doesn't work. Um, the only language I do speak is Hebrew, yeah, and not very well. But in Hebrew, if I wanted, um, you're smoking, and I want a cigarette, so in English, I would say, please may I have a cigarette, or can I have a cigarette? In Hebrew, the translation is, give me a cigarette. So someone walks up to you in a bar that you don't know, and they say, give me a cigarette, and you say, goodbye. Um, so it's very different. The, the words that someone uses, the meaning that they give, may not be quite as rude or polite or mean exactly what they think. So you've got to be aware of that. And this is the traditional lolcat slide that every presentation should have. But it introduced me to the pussycats. Okay, so this, was a com this is a situation we had on a mailing list. We use a lot of Google groups for mailing lists for certain stuff. And I'm usually online pretty much 9, 9 a.m. European time till midnight. Of course, America's keeping going. So when I log on in the morning, if it's a busy mailing list, there might have been a lot of activity. And I logged on, and somebody had used the word pussy. Uh, it was a guy from Croatia. So English is his second language, but the English he speaks is British English. And what he said in his email was, I have found this bug, and instead of being a pussy, here is the solution. Now, in British English, the use of the word pussy there means instead of being timid or shy or expecting somebody else to do it for me. In American English, the word pussy is a female body part. So by the time I woke up, this conversation, this simple email that said, instead of being a, you know, here's a bug and here's a solution, had become this outrageous argument about how dare you use this word in a public mailing list. And it had come, so the, the actual bug has long been forgotten. Yeah, I don't even remember what the bug was now. But the argument about using the word pussy still exists. Yeah, people still talk about that argument, but no one remembers what the, the real issue was. If I'd been online, I would have sent a quick email to the list saying, guys, this is a lost in translation moment. Unfortunately, I wasn't, and the only people who were online took the word pussy to mean one thing, and how outrageous it was for this guy to use this word. So that's a challenge. The only solution to it is just to try and constantly remind people to be aware that English isn't everybody's first language, and their usage of it can be different. So as I said, American English and British English are not the same thing. Yeah, they do have differences, and actually the Americans and the British people have more difficulty understanding each other than the Germans and the Americans, or the Germans and the Brits. We have more dif differences that way than we do any other. So with these, la so there's lots of different language barriers that we have, um, but they can be overcome just by becoming aware of them. 
Yeah, just by accepting that that's an issue. Occasionally, you'll see on a mailing list or a bug report where the description is not great, someone saying, please just write it in your own language and somebody else is able to translate it. Or maybe, could you record a small video to explain the bug? Yeah, because it, or, or send some screenshots, because that will help us understand it better. So you can overcome those issues if you are aware of them. If you're not, you just say, oh, he's an idiot, and just push it aside. So that's language issues. But what about cultural issues? There's lots of cultural differences. I mean, I'm British, so I like my, milk, my tea with milk. Some people like it with lemon. Some people like mint tea, or some people even like Japanese tea. In completely off topic, but you know the, Br the English tea that you have here in Germany that comes in the little Lipton's tea bags? Yeah? Or you get anywhere in the world English tea, it's Lipton's in little bags with paper envelopes and tags. You can't find that anywhere in England unless it's a place for tourists. Okay, so it's not English tea. So completely off topic. And of course, being geeks, most of us have coffee that we're nuking in the microwave because it went cold because we were busy on some code. So we are one world, but we are lots of different cultures. You mentioned um, in your previous thing about Romanians having an issue about trusting other people. Yeah, historical and cultural reasons that trust is a, is, is a problem. That's a cultural issue that a lot of us don't share. So how can we become aware of them? The only way is by people of those cultures explaining it. We can't assume it. Now in Joomla, we have user groups. Yeah, this is a map, it's a little bit out of date, of where the user groups are around the world. Um, if, the, if the map, I've zoomed in a bit, but if the map did go down here, we do have one guy in, near the South Pole who does use Joomla, and there is someone in the Pacific Ocean in the Hawaii as well. So they would be included. But you can see we're pretty much spread around the world, particularly strong in Europe and South America. But in the Netherlands, which is a very small country, we have, I think now it's 18 user groups that meet every month. And they vary in size from 8 people to 30 people, but that's 18 of them meeting every month. And that's absolutely brilliant. But then we go to Italy, and there's none. There's not one user group that meets in Italy. But we have what we call Joomla Days. So that's national-based Joomla events, one day or two day. And when they have it in Italy, they get over 1,000 people. The one in the Netherlands gets 300. So clearly, there is a difference in culture about attending a user group and attending a, a big event. It doesn't, you know, in England, we've got, I think we have one user group left. Yeah? People are not really interested in that sort of thing culturally, but they are interested in, t in attending a big event. So that's a cultural difference. Now, what can we learn from that? that excuse me, local models do not transfer across the world. Yeah, so I saw Typo 3 just done an event in Poland. Yeah? So we had just done some Joomla events in Poland as well. Great attendance at the event. They tried to get user groups started. Nobody came. We did another big event. Loads of people came again. So it wasn't that people weren't interested. It's just that they weren't interested in the regular user group. Maybe that's a cultural difference. Yeah, maybe it's about the not wanting to share with other people. You know, I don't know, but if it works, what works in one place cannot necessarily be transferred across somewhere else. And we see this a lot with events. When a, when a new country decides to organize a Joomla day, what do they do? Do they look at the best way for them to organize it, or do they look at the best one that exists and try and copy it? And usually, you, do, you look at the best one that exists and try and copy that. So the one in the Netherlands, it's a two and a half day event, it's 300 people, all staying in one hotel, and there's dinner, and everything's thrown in. And there's five sessions on at once, but that's their eighth year of doing it. If it's your first event, and you try and do that, that's not gonna work. You're not gonna have enough people. You're not gonna have enough speakers. So you can't just copy from one place and apply it to the other. So copy-paste community model does not work. So this was an issue in the Joomla community, and it's an issue in all open source communities, paid development. Um, 
So currently in Joomla, there is nobody at all who is paid for anything. Um, I'm lucky to get my expenses for going to an event. Yeah? So nobody gets paid for anything. We did try it. Um, we did try it a few years ago. Two people were paid developers. And the idea was we were, we, we were going through a change in the framework like Typo3 is, and we sort of, it was going a bit slowly, and we thought if we paid those two guys to do the work full time, it would work much better and much faster. The reality is it caused a lot of problems. And what were those problems? Well, the first one was why those two guys and not me? Yeah? I volunteer just as much time as you do, or I volunteer just as much time as they do, why are they being paid and I'm not? You're devaluing my contribution. So that was one issue. One of the other issues was some people voluntarily give to the community 20, 30, 40 hours a week. Yeah, not many, but there are people who do that. It so happened that those two guys who became paid, they were two of the guys who did that. So they were working full time and giving community time as well, 30, 40 hours. What happened when they got paid was they were paid for 30 hours, they did 30 hours, and they did no more community time. So we actually got less work out of them by paying them than we did beforehand. So it was, and we also didn't have a structure to manage people that you're paying. Yeah? Those of you working companies with more, you know, more than a few people, you have a boss who's, wa who's watching your timesheets, who's, who's watching your task list, watching what you're actually doing. The task that these two guys were given was difficult stuff, was hardcore, fundamental, groundwork stuff. You're going to have a lot of false paths that you're going to go down. But the outside perception was that they were doing nothing, because nobody saw any pr product at the end of what they were doing. So the perception was they were just taking the money and doing nothing. So that also caused issues. We've considered bringing it in again in the future. But one of the problems we've got is how much would you pay somebody? Now, if the, let's say we've got three people up for the, that we're considering for a specific job. One lives in the US, one lives in Europe, and one lives in India. If you paid them all the same salary, the guy in India is going to be a million, equivalent of a millionaire because then their average salary is so much lower. Is that right? Should we be paying the guy in India the same ratio of salary? If we're paying that guy the same ratio, you know, a good developer income for India, that's going to be much cheaper in real terms than paying someone in America. Does that mean that as the people at Open Source Matters who look after the money are going to say, yeah, we're not employing any Americans, we'll just employ Indians? Is that right? So these are all issues that we're come up every time someone says we should look at paying people again. There are issues that we have no answer to, which is one of the reasons why we're not paying anybody uh, to do stuff. But it's definitely something to consider. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's a great idea. One of our problems in Joomla is we've got no problems and shortage of people writing specifications. We've got problems of people carrying out the, you know, with the skills to carry it out. So, but yep. Absolutely, and for everyone it's going to be different. For us, it doesn't work. Um, for, other, for other projects, it definitely does. So how do you handle the contributors that you have to your community is really important. And we have contribute, everybody, every community has contributors at lots of different levels. And I'm quite, I want everybody to contribute to their project. I'm quite happy though for you to define for yourself what contribution means. 
contribution to you might mean giving a donation. That's great. It might mean to you submitting a bug report. That's also great. It might mean to you submitting real code. That's also great. I don't mind what you do as long as you feel it's contributing. I don't want you just to be using. I want you to be contributing. The worst type of contributors are the one-shot drive-by contributors. They come in, submit a massive code or feature or something, and then go. And you've lost, first of all, you've lost them. But second of all, they quite often aren't even there for the follow-up question. And they often want a certain structure. They want, oh, how do I submit code to Joomla? Oh, they've got GitHub. Right, I'll just submit a pull request. No explanation, no documentation, no workflow process that we need. They just submit the pull request and go. And then they're really angry that we say, actually, can you submit an issue on the tracker with the following details? No, I've, I've given you the code. You use it or don't use it. I don't care. Yeah. They're the worst type of contributors, and we waste a lot of time trying to make, turn those drive-by contributors into real contributions that we can use. And more often than not, we can't. And there is no great solution to it other than making the issue tracker code submission as easy as possible. But no matter how easy you make it, there's got to have a workflow and a structure. And in, quite often, it's not easy enough for those guys. So we have an issue in Joomla. Um, what they want to do, what some people want to do, they want to go, here you are, here's the code. So we want to say, how do I test it? How do I repeat it? And we have a process that it goes through of review, etc., before it gets committed. And there might be points saying, yeah, we really like your code, but from a code style point of view, can you use dollar app instead of dollar K? Well, they've gone. And it sits there in the queue waiting for that original contributor to come back and make that change from dollar K to dollar app, but they've gone. So it just sits there and sits there until the point somebody says, oh, maybe we should have a look at it ourselves. At that point, it's maybe already gone. You know, we might have replaced it with something else, and we've lost that contribution. So one thing we've tried is gamification. That's trying to make some way of having some scores or something for people to see. Now, we've got a couple of different ones. Um, we have what's called the bug squad. So every, every issue that gets raised has to get, so you have to raise an issue, you have to submit some code to fix it, or just test it that it works. And I think on this you can see um, the blue is that you've commented on the tracker, the yellow is that you've done some tests, and the gray is that you actually wrote some code. Now, these are the points for the last seven days. You can see my name is at the top. But you can also see I've contributed almost no code. Yeah, because I'm not a coder. Yeah, but I can, I can look at an issue and confirm that it is a bug. It's not just a user error. And I can look at a, a solution and test the solution to make sure that it fixes it. So that's great. The, you know, there are other people on there. There's a guy about six down, Marc Antoine, T uh, I'm not even going to pronounce his surname, lives in a Caribbean island. Yeah, he's a very small, small website builder, very small brochure websites. He also can't really do code, but he can test. And pretty much he's giving like an hour a day, just looks at the new reports. Yeah, yeah, I can confirm that. Hits it. That's great. And for someone like him, this sort of stuff is really a great way to say thank you. Yeah, to publicly say thank you. It's an automated list, automated reports, so and no one has to do any work to maintain it. It just happens. But this doesn't always work, because this is the same one for the documentation. And there you can see the documentation, um, I think this is for the last month, you can see two guys have done almost all the edits on the wiki. So it does work for code sometimes. In our case, it doesn't work for documentation. So you can't just say that gamification is going to work. It might work, it might have some effect, but you can't guarantee it. So you can use different things at different places. So what's my conclusion? None of this stuff is easy. Yeah, there is no perfect answer to how to run a community, how to run an international community, how to get volunteers, keep volunteers. There's no easy answer. The important thing is always to have fun, for me. Um, whether that's with beer, 
um, or just with friends. That's, you know, at the end of the day, if you're giving your time, your free time to something, yes, it may affect your business as well, but it's also your free time, your hobby, your interest. You want to make sure you're enjoying it. If you're not enjoying it, you're not going to really do it. The more you enjoy it, the more you do it, so the more you contribute. So it's always important to have it fun. So it's not just about having great leaders. It's about working all together. It's about, for me, being involved in open source community is all about helping a friend, telling a friend, and teaching a friend. And if they're not a friend before you start that process, they're definitely a friend after you've completed it. Oh, and finally, making a friend. So it's all about the people that are involved and what you can do together. So I've not quite finished. It's not about who is bigger, whether Typo 3 or Joomla is bigger. Just if you're interested, the statistics show that in Germany, Typo 3 is bigger, but in the rest of the world, Joomla is much bigger. But it's not about that. It's not even about who's better. What for me is important is that 65.5% of the top million websites in the world don't use a CMS. Never mind an open source CMS, they don't use a CMS. So that's the most important thing for me, is to get all those guys using a CMS. If they use an open source CMS, even better. For me, if they use Joomla, or for you if you use Typo3, that's even better still. But that's a huge marketplace that's out there. So it shouldn't be about who's bigger or better, Typo3, Drupal, Joomla, WordPress, Papaya, Umbraco, whatever. It's about, there's a big market out there ready to be converted, ready to use a CMS, and we've got to be there to embrace them and to welcome them in. Some of you who are in my uh, talk, uh, Petra Kutcher talk, have seen this slide before. I've said I do it in every session. Um, my usual rule is I don't allow questions. Um, but you can ask me a question at any time if you give me a coffee or a beer. Uh, you have to allow me to go to the toilet at some point because too much coffee or beer, you know, it really doesn't work. Um, but that is the trouble with triples. Thank you very much. And I, I, despite my rule, and despite this, you know, because there's no coffee or beer allowed in this room, um, if you do have any questions, I'm happy to um, take a few. Anybody? Sorry? I discouraged you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, you know, um, I've now spoken at, uh, I've spoken at Typo3 and at Drupal and at Civi CRM. Um, and it was great to be invited to come and speak here. Because for me, as I said, it's about sharing that information. It's about me sharing what Joomla's experience has been, but also me learning what Typo3's experience has been. We've all got the same issues. Yeah? We address them different ways. We sometimes think they're more important than other things. You know, we rank the issues differently within our own uh, communities. But they're the same issues, and we can all learn from each other. And that's, what, that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm so great to be invited. Olivier. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, so I'll just repeat the question for the benefit of the microphone. Do I think it's better to remove those barriers and trenches between the communities and maybe have a joint event somewhere at some place and stuff? So actually, I'm really, I'm really pleased. At this, right now, there's another session called CMS Garden because it's kind of happening right now in Germany anyway, uh, which is the open, various open source CMSs have got together to have one exhibition space at CBIT and DMS Expo. Um, and so where they could never do it on their own. And that's the first step. I have to say, Germany is the only place where I've come across that happening. I would love it if we remove those barriers at a technical level. If anyone is a developer in the room, there's a thing called PSR and FIG. 
um, which means nothing to me other than I remember the three letters. Um, and that's a, that's a whole concept from a technical level of making code interoperable. Um, so that is happening at the real hardcore coding level, but that's gonna, that will take time. At the community levels, I hope that in Joomla we are welcoming to other communities, and hence I'm here and David's here and stuff, and we've spoken at other events, and at our world conference next week, Matt Mullenweg, who's the boss of WordPress, is speaking at our conference. Um, sadly, that's not true for everywhere. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to speak at Drupal Camp. I spoke at DrupalCon in Germany uh, last year, and I'm speaking at a, Dr a local Drupal Camp next week. So, the, with, what's this expression? With small, acorn, with small acorns, big trees grow. I don't want us to be merged. I'm not, I wouldn't want to propose that we ever merge and just have one open source CMS. That would be a silly thing to suggest. But we can, in our own attitudes, make it more friendly and more um, between each other. Um, I, don't, I don't like these which is bigger, which is better um, things. It's not important to me. What's important, is, what's important to me is someone that's using open source software. That's what's important to me. What they're using doesn't matter. And then if they're using open source software, I want them to be contributing in some way to it. That's what matters. Um, I think we could probably waste a lot of time trying to organize joint things and people say, well, what are you going to do together? We can't talk about the code because we approach the code very differently. If we were to take Drupal and Joomla, for example, at a code level, up until Drupal 8 gets released, the code style is one's object oriented and one's procedural. There's, there's, no, there's nothing one, code, one set of developers will learn from the other set. They'll just argue over which is a better way of doing the code. So it doesn't, we don't benefit from that. So I'm not sure what we could actually do if we did together, but I definitely don't want to see, you know, uh, barriers. But I mean, I'd, I've been to, um, I spoke at the launch of Windows 8, and I was there when Steve Ballmer was storming up and down the stage, Windows, 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 developers, developers, developers. and that is very much the attitude we don't want. You know, we're better than you. That's not what it's about. Um, so, yeah, we, we can... Stop. We, we, don't, we just have to not spend time worrying about what other people are doing. Worry about what you're, what you're doing yourself. Has anybody else got a question? No? Okay, so other than the fact that I've shared with my favorite uh, episode of Star Trek is The Trouble with Tribbles, thank you very much.